morning. Very good to be with you. I hail from the uh, concrete jungle of the Dallas Metroplex, so I discovered trees on my, uh, on my drive in this morning. It is beautiful to be here. And last night I, I had a lovely time with uh, Dr. Finn. So wonderful to be here about the good things happening uh, in chapel and happening at, uh, at the university here. I want to begin taking us back to around 155 A.D., just over 100 years after the death of Christ, to the little town of Smyrna, where a Christian minister named Polycarp is leading the people of God. This is a time when, after the ministry of Peter and Paul in the book of Acts, the church is spreading and going to the nations and going out. Some of the struggles, though, the church is facing are due to the fact that they're surrounded by a pagan world. There are idols on every corner, and there is idolatry that is infused into the culture itself. And then along came the church, and Christianity began destabilizing that synergy between paganism and the culture, like a a pious group of party crashers. The church showed up on the scene, and refused to participate in pagan worship and pagan rituals. Christians had this audacious claim. There is only one God who rules and reigns over the whole world. And that this one true God who rules and reigns over the whole world demands our highest allegiance and our highest authority. This conviction was a matter of first principles for the church, and it shaped their entire view of the world, their entire view of life, their entire view of reality. For their fellow citizens, this was a treasonous act. But the church knew the words of the Apostle John. Little children, keep yourself from idols. Knew the words of the Apostle Paul. You know that when you were pagans, You were led astray by mute idols, however you were led. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking in the Spirit of God ever says Jesus is accursed. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. As the apostles show us, it was not easy to be a Christian. And that brings us back to Polycarp and to Smyrna. Roman soldiers would disperse to Polycarp's house. They show up at his door. Polycarp, the Christian leader, invites the soldiers in, has a table set before for his enemies, and they feast while he asks for a few hours to go pray. In the next room, as Polycarp prays, as the soldiers ate, they listened to this pious Christian bishop pray, and they were so convicted on the ride back when they were taking him to the amphitheater to be killed They beg him to swear allegiance to Caesar and just pinch a little incense to the idols. Just do it. Come on. What's the problem here? You could be hanging out with your family this afternoon, having lunch. It's no big deal, right? They were so convinced they tried to persuade him. As Polycarp entered the amphitheater, you could almost hear the echoes of 1 Peter 3.15. Always be prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for the reason of the hope within you. When they saw him, the crowd at the amphitheater roared. They called for his death. And this is the words of the martyrdom account that they shouted. This is Polycarp, the teacher of Asia, the father of the Christians, the destroyer of our gods. The text recounts how they, just, they beat him and jeered him. And then in the amphitheater, when Polycarp stood before the Roman proconsul right there for his crimes... This is the interchange that took place. When he confessed that he was a Christian, the proconsul tried to persuade him to recant, saying, have respect for your age. You're an old man. (laughs) Come on. How hard is it? Pour out a little offering. Pinch a little incense. You are a Christian. Have respect for your age and other things. Swear by the genus of Caesar, which would have been an image of Caesar. Say away with the atheists. Christians were the atheists in this sense. Polycarp looked solemnly at the crowd around him, the lawless heathen, who were in the stadium, and he waved his hand, motioning at those in the crowd, and looked up to heaven and said, away with the atheists. 
a little hint of irony in the midst of his defense. But the proconsul was insistent. Swear an oath. Revile Christ. We'll let you go. Polycarp replied, a very famous line, for 86 years I have served him. And he never wronged me. How can I blaspheme my king and my savior who saved me? The proconsul was insistent, swear by the genus of Caesar. Polycarp replied, if you vainly expect that I will swear by the genus of Caesar, as you say, pretend that you do not know who I am. Listen carefully. I am a Christian. Woo! <laughs> Now, if you want to learn the teachings of Christianity, appoint a day, give me a proper hearing. I'll meet you at the coffee shop later. I got a lot I can share with you. The pro council said, why don't you persuade the people? Polycarp said, you I count worthy of response, for we have been taught to appropriately respect rulers and authorities appointed by God as long as they do us no harm. He is quoting Romans 13 right there in front of a political authority. And notice he says, we have been taught. This implies some type of discipleship, some type of catechesis. They have trained their people on how to respond to political authorities right there. He said, as for them, I do not consider them worthy. The proconsul said, I have beasts. I will throw them to you. He said, call them. Repentance from better than worse is impossible to us. But it is good to turn from those things that are evil towards those things that are righteous. He said to him, I will have you consumed by fire since you don't care about the wild beasts unless you turn. And Polycarp replied, you threaten me with fire that burns for an hour and is extinguished. For you do not know about the coming judgment and the eternal punishment reserved for the ungodly. So why do you delay? Bring on what you want. As he spoke these and many other words, Polycarp was filled with courage and joy, fortitude and joy in the midst of a martyrdom account. Fortitude and joy. His face was filled with grace. He not only did not collapse in terror at the things said about him, but on the contrary, the proconsul was astonished and sent his own herald into the middle of the stadium to announce Polycarp is a Christian. Polycarp is a Christian. Polycarp is a Christian. Three times. After this, Polycarp was burned at the stake and killed. His story was written down in a martyrdom account dating to the second century that was passed around to the churches as motivation to remain faithful in the midst of suffering, in the midst of oppression. Not all Christians were as strong as Polycarp. That's part of the reason they're writing it down and sending it around. There were many who pinched incense to Caesar and walked away. Some of the martyrdom accounts record those episodes. While this story took place nearly 1,800 years ago, there are many things about it that resonate with our world. In his book, Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self, Carl Truman diagnoses the ills that plague our world, our society. He draws upon philosophers, theologians, and many that show how our world is becoming secular and pluralistic, driven by what he describes as an expressive individualism. An expressive individualism, he quotes the words of Robert Bella, who says, expressive individualism holds that each person has a unique core feeling, an intuition that should unfold or be expressed if individuality is to be realized. In other words, the truth is inside you, the mini you, the little you, the special you, the you inside you that must be expressed regardless of any external authorities, regardless of politics, regardless of church, regardless of educational institutions, you have a truth inside you that must be expressed. This is what philosopher Charles Taylor has also called a culture of authenticity, where each one has his or her own way of realizing their humanity, and it is important to find and live out one's own humanity against conformity to any truth outside you whether it be society, 
educational institutions, religious or political authorities. Truth is now found within us. It's an internal reality. We must be authentic. We must be real. We must be true to ourselves. You do you. No cap, as my kids say. I think I got that right. <laughs> this, is, this has created a world full of many gods, little idols, everyone an idol to themselves, complete with their, their own stories of self-expression, their own morality that must be expressed. But after diagnosing our cultural situation, Truman ends his book saying this. In the second century, the century like Polycarp, the church was a marginalized sect within a dominant pluralist society. This is where we are today. The second century world is, in a sense, our world where Christianity is a choice and a choice likely at some point to run afoul of authorities. For more than 1,600 years, Christianity has provided the West the theological and moral bonds that have held Western civilization together. From the time of Constantine in the 4th century, all the way up through recent years, Christian morality, Christian doctrine has provided the fabric and the framework for society. The well-known French historian, Alexis de Tocqueville, when he came to observe America in particular in the 19th century, argued that religion took no part in the government itself, but it was the foremost institution because it infused all other institutions. In this brave new world, the mores that bind together our social world and our social order are no longer distinctively Christian. We are moving from a world where Christian theology and morality that is a coherent doctrine of God, a coherent understanding of the human person, a coherent understanding of creation and relationship to God are now competing for cultural real estate. We are now competing in the public square. This is what it means to live in a secular world. Not that Christianity is gone, but now it is merely one option among many options. And I know for people in here, frequently not the easiest option to embrace. If you want some stats that sort of unpack these realities, last year, Michael Graham, Jim David, and Ryan Burge published the book, The Great Dechurching, 2023. The book's argument is simple and sobering. In the United States, we are currently experiencing the largest and fastest shift in religious in history of our country. As tens of millions of formerly Christian worshipers nationwide have decided that they no longer attend church, 40 million adults in America who used to go to church no longer do, which accounts for 16% of the adult population. For the first time in Gallup Poll's eight-decade history in 2020, church membership fell below 50%. From the 1990s until today, it had always been above 70%. If you want a second opinion, if that diagnosis isn't sobering enough, you want a second opinion. Last year, Stephen Bullivant, a British sociologist, published the book Nonverts, The Making of Ex-Christian America. Like the great dechurching, Bullivant argues that the U.S. is in the midst of a culture, social, and, uh, a social and cultural religious watershed, one that Americans are living out. He describes the rise of what the call, are called the nuns. No doubt you might be familiar with this kind of classification. And argues that right now, based upon his analysis, there are 59 million nuns. These are people that stare at a survey and check a box that says, I have no particular religious affiliation. 59 million nuns, 44% of 18 to 29 year olds. In 1990, that number was less than 10%. Among these numbers, Volovance investigates what percentage of those nuns used to go to church. What percentage of that 59 million were at one time churchgoers? He calls them nonverts. They've now left. 41 million of that 59 million are nonverts. He estimates 16 million ex-Catholics, 7.5 million ex-Baptists, 2 million ex-Methodists, 
and so on. Only 30% of nuns were raised as nuns. What all this means is we're witnessing a slow, steady loss of doctrine and Christian morality as the binding our social world. Because all of you are making moral choices. When you walk out these doors and you enter the world and you enter the workforce and you enter whatever job you're going to have, you're going to have to order your life according to some kind of morality. It may be the inner you, the internal you that needs to be expressed, or it may be Christian and doctrine and morality that might be handed down to us. In the scriptures. I know for some of you this might be tough. It is for me. These are our family. These are our friends. These are people who used to be in our Bible studies, people who sat with us in church, people who attended our church events. If you want one more stat, one graph that summarizes the findings of the majority of high school seniors in 2022 never or rarely attended any Christian Christian worship service. We now are graduating high school senior classes that are often, and the majority of which, are not attending church. One other sign. Last year, or earlier this year, the American Bible Society published a state of the Bible report. In 2024, the percentage of Bible users, that is people who read the Bible at least three times per year outside of a worship service, dropped to 38%. Only 38% of people in the U.S. are even picking up the Bible three times per year. But again, they're ordering their, their lives according to some kind of standard, some kind of vision of life. This is the bad news. <laughs> This is the diagnosis, and unless we get a real sense of what on earth is going on, it's hard for us to come together and be to chart away. How do we chart a way forward? There are bright spots. As, he, as uh, Dr. Finn mentioned, I work at, worked in higher ed. I worked at Southwestern, worked at Southern Seminary for many years. I still teach at Southern Seminary, serve, teach church history, but I also have the privilege of working for the Center for Religion, Culture, and Democracy, which is a think tank housed within the largest religious liberty law firm in the country called First Liberty. So every day when I chat with the people at First Liberty, I hear all kinds of stories of people of faith living out their faith in the public square, trying to figure out how to live the Christian life in a world that looks radically different. This is where things, how do we respond now? Well, this is where things get a little complicated. Do we retreat? Do we conform? Do we form isolated, protected communities of resistance? Do we seek political wins, social reforms? Do we capitulate? Do we do nothing? Do we say, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow you die? Amid these competing voices, I think returning to the early church might offer us just a little wisdom this morning on how to chart a way forward. I want to summarize the way the early church engaged the culture with three key ideas. I'm going to talk about identity, I'm going to talk about discernment, and I'm going to talk about hope. These are the three core ideas of the book I just published and the three core ideas that I draw out of how the early church responded to a pagan world that surrounded them. First, identity. I chose identity very specifically. It's a popular postmodern term that I'm trying to use to describe how the early Christians understood who they are in relationship to the pagan world around them. For Christians created in the image of God, saved and redeemed and growing in conformity to the likeness of Christ, our idea is not discovered from inside us. Our identity is received. 1 Corinthians 15. Now I want to remind you, brothers, the gospel I preach to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved right now. The early church knew this implicitly because they didn't live in a Christian society. They knew the gospel had to be something received. It had to come to them. It had to shape their world. It required discipleship, catechesis, sometimes longer periods of it. The early church knew 
that they lived in a pagan world full of idols and idolatry. And if they were going to survive, they had to be fitted with the armor of God and prepared to meet all the assaults of the evil one that lay before them. New converts had to be formed body and soul in conformity to Christ's likeness and doctrine and morality. One of the earliest, in the early church, one of the earliest Christian discipleship manuals was given to us by a church father named Irenaeus of Lyon. And this is the way he describes it. The human person is formed body and soul. So it is fitting that the human person needs to be formed in doctrine and morality. Body and soul, doctrine and morality. What profit is it? Irenaeus writes, to defile the body and perform evil deeds? Or what profit is it to claim the holiness of body if the truth is not in your soul? Doctrine and morality, what you believe and how you live, have got to be held together. Irenaeus writes, when they are joined together, it is a beautiful thing to behold, it is true human flourishing. When we see someone living in accordance to God's commands, confessing the one true God, and their life evidences the beauty of it. How can we expect Christians to know how to deal with all these social changes if they're not formed spiritually? How can Christians deal with changes in education, changes in marriage, changes in the workplace, changes in the military, changes throughout our culture if they are not familiar with Christian morality? Christians will all not always agree principally about how to respond to these changes. We will have principled disagreements about ways forward, but we will surely not be able to come to decisions if we do not have a coherent understanding of what does it mean to believe in God and what are the basic moral standards that God calls us to. I'll give you an example of a person that I think recognized this. Ian Hershey Ali recently wrote a piece, Why I Am Now a Christian. She was raised as a Muslim. She read Bertrand Russell's famous philosophical work, Why I'm Not a Christian, rejected Christianity, and then recently has realized that the worldview of uh, of Western world right now is no longer promoting human flourishing. She said, why did I become a Christian? I became a Christian because Western civilization is under threat from different forces. And we've always tried to fend off these forces with with military and economic diplomacy and technological efforts. But at every round of conflict, we're losing ground in every way. We cannot fight these forces unless we answer one question. And this is a question for all of us. What is it that unites us? What is it that binds our world together? What is it that binds us? The response, God is dead, uh, Ali writes, seems insignificant, insufficient. The only credible answer, I believe, lies in our desire to uphold the Judeo-Christian legacy. Now, if you read her story, I do wish some of her explanation of, the, uh, of Christ and some of those uh, uh, basic gospel proclamation were there. I pray that they are. But what she recognizes is that Christianity is the only hope for the world. I'm not here to propose specific forms of discipleship or catechesis. We're going to chat about this Tonight, when you come and join us, we'll have a good chat. But there are things people need. I trust the creativity of pastors, and I trust those who, uh, who disciple people. But my main point is this. The identity piece of the early church tells us that discipleship is cultural engagement. We need people reading their Bibles. We need places like North Greenville University that are helping to promote these good things. Second point, discernment. Discernment. The second feature of cultural engagement in the early church is what I call a culturally discerning spiritual life. The virtue of discernment is suddenly very important in this day and age. We need to figure out and figure out quickly 
how to live the Christian life in a pagan culture. Discernment means making discriminating judgments about different situations and the morality infused in institutions and courses of action. For the church, this means learning to balance the holy life and holiness with an activism, being engaged and embedded in the world. We are increasingly uh, embedded in a world that is often set against us. In the early church, it's interesting. They often talk about some key images in the Bible. Joseph, Daniel, these are key images for them. People that lived in pagan worlds and remained faithful even unto the potential death. In the early church, they knew passages like Matthew 6, 24. No one can serve two masters. For either he will hate one and love the other, or be devoted to one and despise the other. This text was more than about taxes. It was about how do I conduct myself in a world where I have competing authorities and competing institutions all around me. In the ancient pagan world, Christians who emerged from the waters of baptism making a confession of faith, had to learn how to navigate the world with a new set of convictions. They encountered neighbors with a new perspective, and they weaved new patterns of social engagement. They had to learn how to navigate their jobs, entertainment, military services, civil and civic engagements. They had to learn how to live the Christian life. A good example of this is found in an early Christian text called On the Apostolic Tradition. This text takes us all the way back to the third century, early third century. And what I'm going to read to you is an interview that would take place from a potential convert, someone who is interested in joining the church. And this is an initial interview that the church is having with someone as they're trying to explain to him how the gospel changes everything. And this is what it says. If anyone is a pimp, a procurer of prostitutes, he should cease or be rejected. That's what it says. If anyone is a sculptor or a painter, he should be instructed not to make idols. It's good. You're an artist. Fantastic. That's great. Don't make idols. (laughs) Don't use the gifts God has given you, the hands. In another account, one of the church fathers describes how God has given you these hands and you take these hands and you craft an idol. And then with these same hands, you walk into church and you lift these holy hands in praise. And you hold out these same hands that have been making idols, you hold out these same hands to take the body and blood of Christ. You gather with your friends. Don't do this. If anyone is a sculptor or a painter, he should be instructed not to make idols. If anyone is an actor and makes presentations in the theater, he should uh, desist or be rejected. Hollywood has always struggled since the third century. If you go back and you read some of your classes, you may read some of the old Greco-Roman plays. You know the kind of morality that is infused in some of those plays. The church struggled. How could I participate in these entertainments? If anyone teaches children, it is better that he desist, but if he has no other trade, let him. School teachers, why? Because they had to teach the pagan gods. Some of you have been reading Percy Jackson. They had to teach the pagan gods. I know so many of my kids' friends that know all of the Greek gods because of shows like Percy Jackson. But in the early church, this is their world. These are their texts, and they're trying to navigate. How is it that I continue to teach education in a world where paganism is infused? If anyone is a charioteer or participates in the games, or if you're a gladiator, or if you're involved in gladiatorial games, or if anyone is a priest of idols or a guardian of idols, he shall cease or be rejected. You can see the church struggle. Man, we are embedded in a pagan world, and we have got to figure out how to live. We've got to figure out. 
And that's the thing. You notice that with each of those jobs, they disagreed. Some, some jobs you can do as long as you qualify it. Some jobs you, you really can't do. Some things you need to think about. And the church is there trying to make principal judgment and wisdom about now how then do we live. The text continues discussing all these points, but clearly church matters. Church took these occupations seriously. While many vocations were acceptable, those involved sexual immorality, pagan religious practices, gladiatorial games, all of those must be, must be discussed before one could proceed in discipleship. And this is how discipleship took the form in the early church. In my recent book, I use the image of improvisation. Now, I've spoken about this to know that when I say improvisation, people immediately think Michael Scott or Michael Scarn. And they immediately think of, uh, of that text. And that's not the way I mean when I mean improvisation. I mean a jazz player. I mean someone who is so skilled and, and gifted at improvising. I think this is a helpful image for the spiritual life. Someone that is so infused with Christian doctrine and Christian morality that when they find themselves in the world, they know how to respond in any situation. Or they have been taught, they have been catechized, they have been discipled. They know how to respond when different situations in the culture arise. We are de facto missionaries living in a pagan world, trying to figure out how to live Christian lives in our neighborhoods, our towns, our cities. Are you preparing to be a school teacher? Are you preparing to work in media? Are you an artist or preparing to be an actor? Are you preparing to go into politics? Are you prepared to go into any other fields? In each of these professions, we're witnessing new challenges, new apps, new policies, new initiatives, new laws, and Christians are forced almost on the fly to figure out how to improvise in the tradition in all of these new situations. If you want an example, you can turn to the book Mission Drift. The book Mission Drift, if you read it, it talks about how institutions have historically Christian have moved away from that identity. Things like the YMCA, Children's Relief Fund, plenty of organizations that historically have been grounded in Christian mores but are no longer in any identifiable way Christian. Just last, this last spring, I gave a tour of the religious founding of Harvard. I stood at the Johnston Gate, the oldest gate in Harvard, looked at the wall on the right. There is an excerpt from the charter of the Massachusetts Bay Colony explicitly stating why this educational institution was founded. And it no longer resembles that. Like so many other institutions, Christians are now re-entering a world. And I want to end on a bright note. Note number three is hope. With identity and discernment, Christians walked in hope. Hope is a good thing. Hope is the third ingredient. When I say hope, I mean the words of the famous Nicene Creed, Christ will come again in glory, judge the living and the dead, and establish a kingdom that has no end. We look forward for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. I could point to a whole host of scriptures, 1 Corinthians 15, which I just mentioned earlier, that undergird those statements straight from the creed. In the Roman world, the Roman world had no concept of hope, not in the Christian sense. In the Roman world, their only hope was the expansion of the Roman Empire. And then along comes the church and says, oh, by the way, there is a greater king and there is a greater kingdom that is coming. One day, Christ is going to come again in glory, judge the living and the dead, and establish a kingdom that will have no end. In a recent interview about the book, one of the authors asked me, what was it that really surprised you about the early church? My immediate answer was hope. I have written about hope in the early church. I've talked about hope. But what surprised me, and we saw it with Polycarp in the opening illustration, is that they lived in hope. Hope was the theological virtue that colored everything they did. Hope walked with them when they walked out the door. Hope was there 
with them when they faced martyrdom. Hope was there with them when they were working in their jobs. Hope was there with them when they were worshiping. Hope gave them fortitude and confidence to face whatever lay out in front of them in their world. When it came to hope, hope was there to guide them. If you already know how the movie ends, you don't fear when the main characters suffer. In one martyrdom account, not the Polycarp one, dated to 177 AD, it's called The Martyrs of Lyon and Vienne, and it, de- it, it describes the brutality of martyrdom in the early church at the hands of the pagans. And this is the way the opening of that martyrdom account reads. We cannot accurately tell or describe the magnitude of the distress of the region, the fury against the saints, the suffering of the witnesses, How these pagans trained their subjects against us. We were excluded from the houses, the baths, the forum. It was forbidden for any one of us to appear in any place whatsoever. But the grace of God acted as our general against them. It rescued the weak, set them on firm pillars... They were able to bear with patience against the forces of the evil one. They endured every form of shame or torture. They made light of their great sufferings. They hurried on to Christ, showing the reality that the sufferings of the present moment are not worthy to be compared to the glory that will be revealed in us. When all of those martyrs were going to the death, the words of Romans 8 were on their lips. They entered those amphitheaters with the words of Paul. So live in hope. Walk out your doors. Enter the world with all confidence and all fortitude. Christ is coming again in glory to judge the living and the dead and establish a kingdom that has no end. There is much the modern church can learn from the ancient one. The ancients, to be sure, were not perfect. And more importantly, they are not right here, right now in this room. They are not here to walk out the door. They are not here to enter your job. They're not here to enter your classroom. They're not here to remind you when you get married. They are not here to tell you uh, uh, how to conduct your life. They are not here, but you are. You are here. This is the time God has appointed you to live and serve for Christ and God's glory right here, right now. Leaders like Polycarp and so many others actively discipled new, leader, new believers, patiently lived culturally discerning lives, and walked in hope while they lived in a pagan world. These forms of cultural engagement helped build the structure of the early church's response, and I think they provide a groundwork that can begin to guide us to. Neither retreating, nor assimilating, but firm in our identity and our hope, we too can live the Christian life in a world very much like the early church. Thank you very much.